Well, the Bible says in Psalm 68, verse 5, that he's a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows, and that's who our God is. Even if you didn't have a great earthly father, maybe today is more of a difficult day for you or you're missing your father. God, our heavenly father, is a perfect father, and he's a good father. And, uh, and, I, and I remembered what the joke was while I was standing there. Uh, what's a pirate's favorite letter? You think it's R, but it's true love is for the C. Yeah, that was good. Dude, yeah, come on, let's go. All right, so today on this Father's Day, we're going to talk about manhood, and I've titled this message, Act Like a Man, Act Like Men. Some of you going right now, you're, maybe you're a feminist, and you're like, whoa, 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 you can't say that. That's, that's gender stereotyping. Well, before you get in your Prius and go on home, <laughs> I'm just messing around. Just lighten up, okay? It's okay to joke in church. Let me read you what the Bible says on the subject. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. I'm actually going to ask all the guys and just the guys to read it out loud, so all the men in the house, on the count of three, get ready, guys. In your, in your lowest, deepest voice. <laughs> On the count of three. One, two, three. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Wasn't that just nice to hear? That's just so nice to hear. Let's go. I'm about to say some things that are not p- politically correct, but they are biblically correct. And my assumption is that you came to church today because you don't want to hear a politically correct preacher, but you want to hear a biblically per- correct preacher. What is God's view on things? If you wanted to get someone that was politically correct, you would have just stayed at home and uh, in your pajamas, eating banana pancakes, listening to Jack Johnson, and watching the news. But instead, you got yourself dressed and ready to church. Some of you got dragged the kids out of bed, and you made it here today because it's important to you. And so I'm preaching to the choir but I pray that you would be touched today. Dr. Tony Evans said this about being a father, about manhood. He says, if you want to change the world, change a continent. If you want to change a continent, change a country. If you want to change a country, change a state. If you want to change a state, change a city. If you want to change a city, change a neighborhood. If you want to change a neighborhood, change a family. And if you want to change a family, change a father. And that is simply what the Bible teaches, where men step into their role and purpose Everything begins to flourish. Where men refuse, everything burns to the ground, which is we're seeing a whole lot of men not acting like men today. For instance, let me show you this in some statistics. 71% of inmates and 81% of rapists come from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children come from fatherless homes. 60% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. And I can't believe this, but I'm about to quote President Barack Obama, and here's what he says, children without present fathers are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit a crime, nine times more likely to drop out of schools, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They are more likely to have behavioral problems, run away from home, or become teenage parents themselves, and the foundations of our community are weaker because of it. If you zoom out and look at our nation, you can look at our nation and probably say something similar to what I'm saying is, there is something wrong in our country. Of course, it's a sin issue. And what statistics tell us is that fatherlessness is the number one contributor to crime, homelessness, unwed pregnancy, poverty, and future fatherlessness. But also, not only is this true societally, but also spiritually. In fact, I want to show you some positive news. When it comes to spirituality, if a family member comes to Christ, the influence that they have on the family coming to Christ, if a wife comes to Christ first, there is an 18% chance that the rest of the family all begins to follow Jesus. Now, sometimes what God will do is he'll work upwards from the hearts of the children to the parents. Some of you are here today because your kids brought you to church. They're like, Mom, Dad, I don't want to miss Bible Buck Sunday. I don't want And so here's what also happens is, If one of the children comes to Christ, there's actually 22% chance the rest of the families will be influenced to follow Christ. But if a dad comes to Christ, 94% chance that the rest of the family is influenced to follow Jesus. Wow, what a difference a dad makes in a family. 
So can I just make a very visual point here today? I need one more time the involvement of the men today. I'm asking a lot of you today. But would you lift up your hand if you're a man in this place? Not just dads, but a man. A man. Come on, men. Raise your hand. All right. Leave it up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Now look around the room. I give you permission to scan the audience today, the church. The future of the people with their hands down. Okay, hold on. Yes. The future with the people with their hands down are dependent upon the lives of the people with their hands up right now. That's the truth. This is simply what we see. You can put them down. Thank you. That was a lot for some of you. You're like, oh, man, you're at, this is Father's Day, Pastor. Don't ask me to do one more thing. <laughs> but this is what we see true, true in the Bible and in statistics. And so let's define manhood. What makes a godly man? Well, a lot of people would define a man based upon comic book traits, characteristics. For example, example uh, a lot of people will say, well, you're a man if you drive a four-wheel drive truck. You're a man if, you, if your favorite color is camouflage. You're a man if you have a big old beard or some scruff, or you can take people down in a fight. You're a man if you've got more guns and fingers left. You're a man if, uh, you know, a, a man, he's kind of a guy that likes cold beer, but not too much, just enough. Uh, he loves sports. He hunts and fishes for his own food, and he's a bodybuilder. And all of those things are masculine, manly things, but none of those things make a man. They make you awesome, <laughs> but they don't make you a man. For us to, st to understand what makes a man today, I'm going to start here with what a man is not. Let's talk about what a man is not. A man is not an animal. I'm just a dog in heat. I can't, I have no self-control. I can't change. These are all, these are all things that men say, but they're not true. We have choices that we get to make. We are not animals. Genesis chapter one, verse 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the light. I went skydiving, I went. Oh. Where do they get these songs from? The Bible. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So here's what we get in the Bible is that God creates everything and he calls everything good. He creates the sun and the moon, the sky and the stars, and he separates light from darkness, night and day, and he created land and sea. And then he creates, on the sixth day, animals and mankind. And so we're in the same category as animals because we're the only things, animals and mankind, that are described in the Bible as living creatures. That's what the Bible says. He, he created living creatures. So plants and vegetation don't get that description, even though they're alive and they're growing. They don't get the distinction of being a living creature. But then there's another distinction now made between animals and mankind, where God says, okay, now I'm going to make mankind different than animals, I'm going to make mankind in my image. In our image, he makes them male and female, which, which speaks of the fact that we have a living soul. So we're different than animals. We have a living soul with eternal implications, meaning people will last forever for eternity. Our souls will last forever. And we'll spend eternity in one of two places, of course, heaven or hell, depending on whether we accept and receive Jesus Christ and make him Lord and leader or we reject him. But when God gets to man, when he's getting to the creation part of mankind, we're the only living creatures that he creates in his image, he says. And that makes you and I of infinite value, no matter your race, no matter how much money are, is in your bank account, no matter your abilities or disabilities or anything else. So he creates mankind in his image, and then he breathes, God breathes the breath of life into us. It's, we're the only living creatures that he did that with, where he breathes his breath into us from the dust of the ground, and that's mankind. And so what that means is that man is not an animal. And the reason why I make this distinction is because animals are ruled by their own, their desires. Animals are things of unbridled instinct. When they're angry, they fight. When they're tired, they sleep. When they get an appetite for sex, they'll go head-to-head -head with another animal to win the prize and mate. And many animals will even 
eat their own offspring. Now, some men act like animals. Sometimes the world thinks, well, the manliest dude is the guy who can eat the most food, like Chester, who eats the hot, you know Chester, what's his last name? He was eliminated from the hot dog eating contest this year. They banned him. Anyway, the, I'm getting distracted. But sometimes we think the manliest dude is the guy who can eat the most food, drink the most beer, win the most fights, go to bed with the most women, and then convince the women to kill the child in the womb if they don't feel like fathering them, just like animals. And if we define manhood like that, it should come as no surprise that the abuse of women and sexual assault begins to spike and unemployment rises. And now half of the children in America are born into families without fathers. And that ain't right. But a man is not an animal. Number two, a man is not a boy. There is a difference between the words male and man. There is male man, but that's a different thing. <laughs> There's a difference between being a male and being a man. And just because you're a male, that, that does not automatically make you a man. There are eight-year-olds in my my daughter, Bay, her third grade class, there are biological males in her classroom, but they still cry when they don't get their way because they're boys. And Bay, my daughter, can beat most of these boys up. <laughs> so again, having male genitalia does not make you a man. It just makes you male. But let me show you the difference between a boy and a man. What is the difference between boyhood and manhood in the Bible? Well, here's what boys do. If you're a boy, you tell the rest of the world, you're responsible for me. That's what boyhood is. They go, boys go, feed me, clothe me, house me, clean up my mouth when I'm a mess. When I make a mess in my diaper, you clean me up. Boys live with their parents and make their mom clean up their messes. We still have boys who are 30 years old, making their moms clean up their messes today. And there's nothing wrong with little boys. being a, let, the, let the children play, you know? Let the children play. When little boys act like little boys, it's cute. I have a little boy. He's really cute. He's four years old. His name is Breeze. Breeze David Ansel. Isn't he cute? I'll tell you what's not cute, though. This next picture right here. When... <laughs> When men act like little boys, when grown men act like little boys, that is disgusting. I'm, I'm repulsed of myself right there. <laughs> grown men acting like little boys is the problem in our country. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 2 where God prescribed a very specific order of things. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Step one, work. We were made for it, guys. When you stop working, <laughs> you're, you are rejecting the very design of the way we were created to be. Now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it goes on with the order of things. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and then, and then they shall become one flesh. I don't know if you're seeing the order of things, but I'm going to go very slowly today. Step number one is work. Get a job. Step number two is move out. Step number three is marry a woman. Then step number four comes, then you have sex. That is the order. You can't do number four until you do one, two, and three in that order. All the single guys are like, I don't know. This is, this is up for interpretation right now. I'm not, I'm not, you know, sometimes the Bible's figurative and I don't know if it's literal or not. No, this is, all the dads with daughters are going, yes, that is very clear right now. Come on, dads with daughters, that is very clear. It's not up for interpretation. That is the order if you want God's blessing and favor on your life. If you don't want God's blessing and favor on your life, then do it your own way. And do it like Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. <laughs> but if you want God's blessing and favor and anointing on your life, then do it God's way. In boyhood, everyone else is responsible for me. But along those steps, a boy becomes a man. When that boy says, and he becomes a man, 
He says, no longer are you responsible for me, but now I am responsible for other people and my family. That's when, a, that's when the band Boys to Men starts playing. <laughs> that's the transition from boyhood to manhood. And right now in our world, we have a lot of guys, they have no job, they don't shower, they don't shave, they don't have any shirts with buttons on them. They play video games all day and watch porn all day, and they're like, why can't I get a date? Well, here's why, because women don't want to be a mom and marry a boy. Come on, ladies, let me hear you. I'm, preach I'm preaching really good. I'm preaching really good. Let me tell you another thing. Women think jobs are sexy. Write that down. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That was not. That was, of, that was of the flesh, not of the spirit right there. Okay. So a man is not an animal, and a man is not a boy. And number three, and this is the most controversial of them all, a man is not a woman. Okay, there we go. We, men are designed by God to have an anointing, a responsibility, and an accountability to lead their family not to follow. Genesis chapter 127, let me read it again. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now let me wear my hat of compassion. I've told you the truth, and now I'm going to put the grace on. And what studies have shown is that, for a long time, studies have shown this to be true, that there is a genuine biological and mental issue that's called gender dysphoria. It's real. And historically, the rate has remained steady for decades, where it affects one out of every 30,000 people to one out of every 100,000 people. So it's a very small number of people that have historically experienced what biologists and sociologists call gender dysphoria. And for people who experience that agony, if somebody genuinely wrestles with that issue, I have tremendous, tremendous compassion for them. I can't even begin to imagine that sort of struggle and wrestle. So hear me, I'm not against you. And the Lord Jesus loves you, and he created you in his image, and you and your body matter to him. Your body matters to God. In fact, our bodies don't even belong to us, is what the Bible says. They belong to him. These are temples, tents, that are made for the Holy Spirit to live in and reside. That's why Scripture puts a high premium on taking care of your body, because it's a tent of the Holy Spirit. So... We see that that's a real thing. This gender dysphoria is a real thing. But now it's like skyrocketing. And we're seeing it out of, suddenly out of nowhere. It's like 20% of now the next generation is saying that this is an issue. But that is not biology. It's ideology is what we're seeing in our culture. It's an ideology that is being pushed. And it's a mental war that is going on that the devil is using to bring wreak havoc, chaos, and confusion do you see what is happening in our culture? We have compassion on the hurting, just like Jesus did. However, part of having compassion on people is opposing ideologies that are going to hurt them. We don't want people to mutilate themselves because they're confused. And so what we need to do is we need to understand from the Word of God that God created people biologically male and biologically female with differences written down into their DNA and into their spirits and even down to the way our brains are wired. I really don't need to tell you much, but boys and girls are different. And thank God for the differences. All of these differences between male and female are not bad. They're good. They're beautiful things that are meant to complement one another and image the glory of God together. I'm so thankful my wife is not like me. That's a good place to clap. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says this, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. <laughs> Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, hold on, pastor. I'm offended. What do you mean I'm a weaker vessel? The word weaker vessel in this scripture is the word for cup. It's something you drink out of. So all the Bible is saying, hey, there's a difference between types of vessels, and men and women are different vessels. Some people get caught up, and they're like, weaker must mean worse. And that is not what the Bible is saying. 
Let me show you what I'm talking about right now. I have some vessels up here as an illustration. I have a big gulp from 7-Eleven and a wine glass. And of course, the big gulp represents men and the wine glass or champagne glass represents the ladies. Don't get too excited. We still serve grape juice for communion here. Now, let me ask you some questions, just a little pop quiz. Which one is the stronger vessel? These are not trick questions. Which one is the stronger vessel? The big goal. Come on now. Now, which one is the weaker vessel if it were to drop on the ground? The wine. Thank you so much. Okay, now here's a trick question. Which one is better? All the ladies say wine glass. All the men say big gulp. Isn't that interesting? Huh. Huh. No, the real question is, well, it depends for what use. It depends for what use. If I'm trying to stay hydrated on a construction site, I need a big gulp, not a wine glass. If you're trying to get lucky at the end of a date night with your wife, you're going to need this. I don't drink. I don't, you need to know this, I don't drink, I stay away from it because our family is full, full of a bunch of alcoholics and I've seen the damage that it's done. But occasionally, Hillary will have, Hillary will have a glass of wine <laughs> with her meal and it works out for me. So, but she's my wife in that order, in that job, move out, married, then you get to number four. A home run. All right. Okay, now let me put these down for a second. Men and women are equal in form, but they're unique in function. Are you all with me? I've got a young daughter, again, like I talked about, and I've got two sons, and I can tell you boys and girls are different because when two sticks fall out of a tree, my daughter makes those two sticks best friends. Oh. And then my boys stab each other. <laughs> And they make weapons out of them. And that's okay. Because sometimes that little boy is going to need to trade in a stick gun for a real gun and stand up and act like a man and stand on a wall and defend his country and his family. Come on. These are, these are differences by God's design, and they're good things. So a man is not a woman. So here's the next question. What is a man? And I'm going to try to fly through this as quickly as possible. But there are three distinct callings that God puts on on the man, there are three roles, three responsibilities of every man. Responsibility number one, men are called to be producers. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The first thing that God did when he created man was give him a job to do. Because what do men do without a job? We get distracted. We go off the rails. He says, I'm going to give you responsibilities to build something. There's no woman yet. Eve's not yet created. There's no children. There's no offspring. It's like God is saying, before I bring anyone into your life, Adam, I want to know that you are willing to work. Because I don't want to bring anyone into your life to some lazy man. I want you to be willing to get up out of bed and produce something. And I like the word produce. Because it's not just making money. It's about dreaming and problem solving and taking what God has put in your hands, which is different for every man, and multiplying it. It's not about what is in your hands, the amount you look to your left or right and you do the comparison game. God says, no, you run your race, man, and multiply what I've given to you. It's being a good steward. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, anyone who does not take care of his family and those in his house has turned away from the faith. He is worse than a person who has never put his trust in Christ. So if you're going to call yourself a man, you've got to answer the question, what am I producing and what am I providing? Responsibility number two, men are called to be protectors. The second thing God says is, I don't only want you to work it, I want you to keep it too. The Hebrew word keep means to guard or protect, Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God placed man in the Garden of Eden to work it, to cultivate it, and to guard it, protect it. So God says, I want you, Adam, to be the protector of the realm in which I entrust to you and keep things in order. I want the people that I'm about to bring into your household, Eve and all the children that are going to be brought in, 
I want them to know that you are a man that is the front door of your house, that they feel safe in your arms, that they, when you speak to them, you're gentle, but with everything else that tries to attack, you're a grizzly bear. I want your kids to be able to go to sleep at night knowing that there's, if there's a problem, there's a father present to address the issue. I want there to be confidence in knowing that things are in order. I want your wife to know that you're faithful, that you don't have eyes for anyone else, but you're on guard, keeping watch. Act like men. So God says, I want to make sure that you are the filter of your house so that anything that comes in must come through you. But why would God say that to Adam when the world was perfect and there was no sin in the world? Well, because there was a serpent in the garden, and he was put on lookout to look out for the serpent to make sure that the devil who was put in the Garden of Eden didn't come to tempt Eve, and that lasted for about one verse in the whole Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, and this is what the devil is doing in our culture and to us every day, even as Christians, he'll drop in doubt bombs into your mind. Did God actually say, is God actually good? You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you not touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, that's what happened to the devil too. He wanted to be like God and he fell. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also, be, she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. You're like, why did you act like that right now? Because he was supposed to be the one saying, Eve, no, no, girl. God commanded, God commanded, he's the leader, he's the leader of the household, but he was passive. He said, you know, Eve, you know, she makes her own decisions. She's, she's a strong, independent woman, you know. Uh, I'm going to let her do her thing, and she can make her own decisions. I'm just going to stand passively by and let her do whatever she wants. Lack of leadership. And by the way, leadership doesn't mean bullying or being domineering. So guys, I'm not saying that you are, you are not to be bullying or domineering, but you're the leader of the household, which leads us to the third responsibility of a man. Men are called to be patriarchs or pastors of your own home. So you're to be a protector, a provider, and also the spiritual leader before sin entered and before Eve was even tempted, God says to Adam, look, check this out. Genesis chapter two, verse 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the who? The man. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God says, I'm telling you first, Adam, and I expect you to tell Eve. I want you to be the spiritual leader of the home. I am instructing you and you are to carry this instruction through your whole family, Adam, I need you to produce, protect, and lead those that I bless you with. Adam, I need you to be like Joshua, who's coming a little later than you, Adam, who says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord in Joshua 24, 15. So personally, as the man of God in my house, I'm the man of my house. I don't send my kids and my wife to church. I lead them to church. I don't tell them to read the Bible. I lead them in knowing God's word so that I can help them decipher and discern and to rightly divide it, as the scripture says. I don't tell them to worship, I demonstrate worship. I don't tell them to serve in the church, I watch them, I let them watch me use my gifts and I find the gifts in them and I say, oh man, God can really use you to, to do this. I don't tell them to be generous, I let, I let them watch me be sacrificial to the kingdom of God, I lead the way. I'm going to take the word of God and rightly divide it and make sure that things are in God's divine order in my house because I don't want to let the deceiver come in and get a foothold in my house. So Adam left his post. Eve took a bite of the forbidden fruit and passed it over to Adam and then brokenness, sin, entered the world for the very first time and Adam loses his identity. He's confused. He's running from God and he's in hiding behind a bush. We find God talking and looking for him, Genesis chapter three, verse eight through nine. 
Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. Isn't that awesome? They get to walk with God all day, face to face. That's how heaven is going to be. God's going to restore the, a new heaven and a new earth. And anyone who gave their heart to Jesus Christ is going to live for eternity face to face with God, just like it was originally intended. So in the garden of the cool of day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. <laughs> but the Lord God called to the man, the man, he called him, not Eve. He said, Adam, where are you? I see you, Adam. <laughs> so the number one trap of the devil uses to get men from misunderstanding who God called them to be is to lure them away from the presence of God. Guys, don't ever believe the lie. Ah, when you get t tired and weary, like, oh, I don't know if we should go to church. You better, that all the more, buck up. Get into the presence of God because that's how the enemy lures you away to lure them away from their position in God's divine order of things. The man is supposed to be the protector, the provider, and the spiritual pastor of your home. So to all the males in the room, never apologize for your manhood. One more time, all the guys in the place, we're gonna read the verse we kicked it off with. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. But now a little louder now. A little more bolster in your voice. On the count of three. One, two, three. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Some of you didn't even open your, your mouths. You're still little boys. That's why. Maybe one day. Oh, I'm just kidding. That's okay. I, I'm okay with offending you. Actually, let's fight afterward. Let's go. Okay, no, just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't really want to fight. I don't want to lose. And I don't want a black guy. Don't hurt me. Okay, let's stand for closing prayer, though. I think I just lost everything that I just did right there in that moment. I love you all so much. Thank you for being in, a, in this house, and I appreciate you being mature and, and hearing God's word. And I want to read one last verse. Thank you. One last verse. One last verse before we pray, okay? Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, God said this. He says, I looked for a man to stand up for me against all this, to repair the defenses of the city, to take a stand for me and stand in the gap to protect this land so I wouldn't have to destroy it. I couldn't find anyone, not one. But there are a lot of men in this place who are the real deal, men of God. And I'm so grateful for you. You stand watchful, you stand firm, you act like men, you're strong and courageous. And I praise God for your leadership. But we're gonna ask God for his help because how many of you know we need God's help every single day? So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just wanna pray for the men first in this place. Heavenly Father, I'm asking you to pour out your spirit on these men today. God, I pray that this week, I know that the, what the enemy's gonna do, he's gonna whisper in their ears all the ways that they have failed. He's gonna whisper in their ears all the, all the things that you're not enough. And in that moment, I pray that your Holy Spirit would remind them, yes, but Christ is enough for me and his strength is made perfect in my weakness. And all of my past mistakes can be washed away through the power of the cross. I also pray, Lord, that, you know, everyone can be prideful, but especially men. I pray that we would be gentle-hearted. I pray that we would be open, God, to whatever you want to say to us. It was pride that got Satan kicked out of heaven. So I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be prideful in ourselves, but we'd be proud in you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us all the days of our lives that we would be sensitive to your leading and promptings. For those of you who are in the room, this is for everybody now. If you don't yet know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would like to lead you in a prayer of repentance where you'll ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, you are asking the Savior of the world who died on the cross for the sins of the world. He died, but he rose again. When you ask him to come into your heart, he cleanses you of all unrighteousness and he forgives your sin. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, he casts your sin and remembers it no more. God has a really short memory when it comes to our sin. And so when you try to bring it up and you've, he's already forgiven you of it, but the enemy will try to condemn you of it and remind you of it. But there are those here today who will receive Christ for the very first time. And what a great day it is to give your heart to the Lord. Don't wait another minute today. If you're here today and you'd like to recommit your life, maybe you've walked away from the Lord or it's been a long time since you've been in church 
or maybe today is the first time you've ever prayed a prayer like this, I'd like to lead those into a relationship with Jesus Christ. This isn't church membership. This is a relationship with the God who made you. If you're here today and that's your, that's your prayer, would you just lift your hand so I know who I'm about to pray with all across this place? God bless you. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Let me pray with those who have their, who had their hands lifted. You can put it down. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me white as snow. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. From this day forward, I'm going to live for you, and I need your help. So I invite you, Holy Spirit, to do a work in me. Come live in my heart. Change me from the inside out. Make me more like you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say a good amen, amen, amen. Awesome. Amen, amen, amen.